anybody can, uh, if anybody like Tibo, I can see you. Can you please raise your hand? That means that you can hear me well. Very well. Thanks a lot. That was great. Um, let's start officially. And I would like to welcome you all. My name is uh, Istvan Hegedus, and I'm the chairman of the Hungarian Europe Society, as many of you might know. Uh, let me welcome everybody who is here now and, and for the future who will join us uh, during this long day of conference, simply participating uh, at this event, uh, listening to, to the speakers or being a speaker himself or herself. Uh, I think we will face a fascinating conference, which is really the high point of the uh, events uh, organized by the Hungarian Europe Society this year or maybe ever. So it's, it's a great day and a long day. I hope many of you will be with us uh, for, for a longer period. I know that some of you, especially on the other side of the Atlantic, might join us uh, only later since it's very early uh, in the United States or somewhere else in, the, in America. So uh, let me say a few words uh, as a sort of introduction to our conference uh, today. When we, uh, I mean the Hungarian Europe Society initiated this project, this project what we call uh, uncertain times, well, that was the first wave of the pandemic. It was actually just over in the summer of 2020 when we had in mind to, to start this, uh, this, uh, this series of webinars and later this uh, closing uh, conference. When, well, then back just a year ago, we had no idea what was coming next just after the first wave. But we knew that uh, our lives have changed uh, actually dramatically and the consequences of lockdowns, social distancing and isolation as such are tremendous on our human behavior and uh, relations, including our political relations. Uh, it turned out very quickly that uh, individual liberties have been constrained, economic decline became significant and altogether liberal democracies faced a forceful populist authoritarian challenge worldwide. That, just to mention a few frustrating phenomena just a year ago. Uh, today, a fourth wave is present in Europe. However, less people die, thankfully, uh, thanks to the vaccination projects actually, but we still have to manage this conference online because of still existing difficulties for traveling abroad. Free movement is just partially restored. Yet, uh, it is not evident at all whether COVID-19 will be seen as a real game changer in a couple of years backwards, or we will forget this health crisis soon, just like it happened to the Spanish flu spreading all over in the world after the Great War, Great War 1914-1918. When we initiated this project more than a year ago, international relations were also in deep crisis. The President of the United States uh, just a year ago did not follow any basic rules on the global stage and made almost no decisions that could have been described as reasonable or and, and predictable much to the irritation of his country's traditional allies. Actually, when we applied to the US Embassy in Hungary for a grant, it was quite a positive surprise that we succeeded and uh, gained a, that grant. Uh, thanks, to, thanks a lot for their generous support. Then we also applied to the German Foundation, our longstanding partner, the Friedrich Naumann Stiftung für Freiheit, this time it was not a surprise at all that we received a grant and we are equally grateful to them as well. Well, just to make the contrast today, we have a new US president in office for nine months. And in spite of a fundamental shift in high politics and in almost all policy areas, transatlantic relations still often show a chaotic character. This conference today 
and its clear focus on global politics and the international order, will analyze, with the help of our invited experts, important aspects of a return to great power politics, the future of the necessary US-European alliance, as well as an adjustment, also necessary, of the European Union and its member states to a fast-changing external political environment. We will discuss these issues not only from the perspective of traditional security studies, but will bring into the debates new political, economic, and technological trends, which might influence, perhaps even determine, the history of the 20s of the 21st century. When we initiated this project just a year ago, last year, authoritarian populism was still on its peak in Hungary. Although today we still have the same prime minister, just like Lord Voldemort, he who must not be named this time, his party does not belong either to any mainstream European party and to any political group in the European Parliament. Moreover, Hungary and Poland are under stronger pressure from the European institution than ever before, especially in the matter of the rule of law issues. Whether such development brings a breakthrough in the struggle between pro-European Democrats and populist nationalists, this is more than doubtful at the moment. We will discuss the future of populism on the one side and the future of liberal democracy on the other, again from many aspects. I'm sure that the outcome of the German elections yesterday will be analyzed from this perspective as well. Let me mention one last topic. I do not want to make a long introduction because we will have a very long day. Uh, this topic is not on our agenda today officially, but I think it's important to speak about it a little bit. In Hungary, the united opposition is definitely in a much better shape than a year ago when we started our initiative, this project. We are just in the middle of the primaries where Hungarian citizens can vote for a joint prime minister candidate against the ruling leader of the country. The turnout is surprisingly high. TV debates have brought back an almost forgotten democratic political culture. A new optimism has, optimism has been created through this new elan of the opposite, opposition leaders who competing and collaborating with each other at the same time, showing actually their best capabilities to the public. In case this process leads next year to the defeat of the person, you know, the man who must not be named, without overestimating his political influence in Europe and globally, and his ability spreading an ideological virus all over, but admitting that he became a hero in the eyes of radical right-wing voters, even outside his homeland, the failure of populist authoritarianism in Hungary might have a broader domino effect. A permanent low tide and increasing insignificance of anti-European populist political forces and the German election gave us hope on Sunday, would positively change the prospects of this decade that started so frightening when an unknown virus started to change our everyday lives and political thinking. With this optimistic introduction, I would like to open our conference. Now, uh, I will change my role as uh, after this introductory speech, uh, as a uh, uh, moderator of the first session. We are a little bit ahead of our time schedule. So uh, if you agree, if anybody has a short comment after my introduction, please go ahead. And then we will start in five minutes because there might be some people who just want to join us around uh, 45, a quarter to uh, 11. So if there is any reaction very quickly, please go ahead and uh, I will give the floor to anybody 
even as a short uh, reaction to to the Hungarian very situation. Uh, I cannot see anybody, but I see that there are 32 participants at the moment, which is really a great number. And we expect uh, uh, more than 80 people during the day. So that's uh, in, in a sort of propaganda style, I would say that that's already a success. Uh, for, for the Hungarian Europe Society, at least. Uh, I can see that uh, regarding our next uh, and first uh, session, uh, uh, Roland Freudenstein is here, Thibaut Musiag is here, and I'm not sure whether Veronica Angel is here. Let, let, me, let me check. I cannot see her yet. And since she is the first speaker of the first uh, session, let's wait a little bit. If Veronica, you are here, just send a message, whatever the methods you, ch you choose. But let's wait three more minutes, I guess. I see that many, many speakers are already with us. Yeah, I can see Peter Guba would like to say something. Here you are. I try to, okay, you are unmuted. You are, yeah, go ahead, thank Peter. You. Thank you. I, I hope you can hear me. And, yes. Uh, Thank you very much for the invitation and, and uh, thank you very much for organizing this event, this one and for the NEP. I just would like to follow up on your comment concerning the primaries uh, that is undergoing right now in Hungary and uh, particularly the fact that the, the opposition was able to organize uh, primaries in, in all 19 counties and also in, uh, in rural areas. And uh, as we hear the news, uh, the, the turnout is, is pretty high also um, in, in smaller, um, smaller uh, settlements, so not, not only the bigger cities outside of Budapest. And this is certainly uh, promising and uh, it gives us hope. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for your comment. Actually, just a couple of months ago when uh, it was not evident that uh, primaries uh, would have a positive impact. Uh, it seemed to be that it's quite dangerous when six so different political parties start to start campaigning against each other, whether at the end it would help or it might even destroy the chances of the opposition. And somehow these parties and politicians have understood that uh, they might differ and they should ex express and show these differences clearly to the voters, but on the other hand, they should also send a signal that they are able to cooperate and maybe govern together. And I think from that perspective, the primaries and the TV debates have been really successful. And perhaps uh, we don't know, but the general uh, atmosphere might have even been influenced by these TV debates uh, and, uh, and the performance of the top opposition politicians showing against the so-called, against the Fidesz propaganda that these are uh, unable, incapable political leaders that actually they can speak in a high intellectual level politi as politicians, which shows that they might be able to lead a country later on. But we will see at the moment, we are more optimistic, I think, who would like to see a turn a much more pro-European democratic uh, government next year, but certainly uh, the government and the Fidesz are very strongly and they might really fight back. Okay, uh, I can see Veronica Engel has uh, just joined us. Uh, very nice to see you. And since it's uh, 10.45 without uh, any further chatting, after my introduction, I would like to suggest to start our 
conference uh, with our first session. And uh, it's Veronica who is uh, our, our first speaker. And since we do not have much time, I do not want to introduce you following uh, and explaining your affiliations. I think everybody has the program uh, in front of her or him. So please read who is who because that makes us, gives us more time for real debate. So I would like uh, to ask you, Veronica, to start with your presentation, which is about uh, the future of transatlantic uh, relations. And uh, just a couple of months ago, we had a webinar uh, when, where you uh, actually in another conference where you already presented your views about a future Biden administration. So it's, uh, it's a really a great uh, change that today, we can speak about the political line of the Biden administration since he became president of the United States. But that's not the only topic we are going to discuss. Certainly transatlantic relations uh, mean that uh, we will focus a lot on US politics and what has changed since the Trump era. But we will open up this, uh, this approach to, to many other aspects, uh, including the European aspects and both Roland and Thibault, I'm sure will mention as uh, the second and the third speakers of, uh, of, the, of the session about uh, a, a, a European adjustment to, to the changes uh, on, on the transatlantic relations we face today. So without any further comment, uh, Veronica, please go ahead. As you know, we have one and a half hours all together for the three of you and for a debate. Uh, so please uh, have in mind uh, the time limit, uh, all of you. And let's start with Veronica. The floor is yours, please go ahead. Thank you, Istvan. Just to make sure I, I got it right, it's uh, less than 15 minutes each, right? Right, yeah, that's correct. Okay, excellent. Well, it's good to see everyone again. I'm speaking to you today from um, Bologna, from the uh, Johns Hopkins School um, um, of International Studies. Um, and that is just... Uh, somehow an introduction to say that the transatlantic relation, at least in some parts, works because we still have um, this connection across, across the pond. And um, it's, it's really a pleasure to be here. One year ago, and not a couple of months ago, but one year ago, we met um, in, the, in a similar format invited by, by Ishvan. Um, and I, I wrote for, for, um, for their um, policy agenda at the time and uh, for, um, and I spoke during this conference, um, that the US and the EU remain like-minded strategic partners, but that their minds are not focused on each other. And I followed with the statement that addressing the diminished strength of the transatlantic community is not a priority that will reign high on President Biden's US foreign policy agenda. And I revisited this because I teach risk at, um, at SAIS in Bologna. And sometimes we have to revisit our predictions and see whether we were right. Uh, most of the times we should do that. And this time we were right. President Joe Biden's first year in office confirmed ongoing transformations in the transatlantic relationship that go beyond the trials of Donald Trump's administration. And it also showed that rebuilding the transatlantic community at all costs was not a priority for the Europeans either. So my claim this year is that the transatlantic relations have in fact deteriorated um, significantly over the past decades to the point that they no longer serve an overarching common purpose. So for the time being, it is more likely that this one special relation will remain diminished and that collaborations will not be automatic, but punctual and transactional. Now, this is very important to have this overarching goal because this deterioration means that partners can no longer achieve and maintain equilibrium because they lack clear answers to fundamental questions. 
why does uh, keeping the special status of the transatlantic relationship even matter anymore? If it were to matter, what should partners even strive to achieve together? And what are the mechanisms to achieve those goals? Now, these are important questions which have ideal answers, right? Because acting in concert is necessary when neither side can achieve its objectives acting alone. In this case, the uh, US and uh, the EU and the main partners of, of mostly Western Europe. The partners should strive to achieve the promotion of common standards and regulations. And the mechanisms to do so are through coordinated policy action. So this is the framework that should somehow encompass all activity between partners that are engaged in a common game, let's say. So the question is whether, in fact, are there objectives that the US cannot meet without partnering with the EU? And what are those objectives that the EU needs the US to achieve? But most importantly, is a robust transatlantic relationship necessary for that to happen? Or is just punctual and transactional collaboration on certain dimensions enough for both sides to achieve these goals? Such questions are usually what we ask when we try to predict what is going to happen in, in, in this relationship. And the answer is not straightforward but all signs point in the direction of a case-by-case -case collaboration on most matters. Now, I will not have time to go into all the details of this, also because you're specialists uh, yourself, but the theoretical part is important. And when we identify these case-by-case -case collaborations, we can see that most of the time they are placed under this great umbrella, again, of democratic promotion. So the only answer that seems to permeate agendas right now on why should transatlantic partners have a dense and coordinated relationship and prioritize each other rather than prioritize other partners seems to be, again, democracy promotion as a world value. And this worked for a long time, and it's a resurgent concern um, that, that is, is taking place. And it worked for a long time during the Cold War, immediately after the fall of the Berlin Wall. Is it not clear that it, it's not as clear that it will work now? Because with the migration of the Republican Party further to the right of the political spectrum, the rise of Donald Trump, the rise of nationalism and authoritarian trends um, in Europe as a whole, West and East, it is not clear that everyone is still in agreement that democracy promotion is part and parcel of the transatlantic community um, set of common goals, or that they have the same understanding of what democracy even means. So as a consequence, this sole overarching objective is not likely to be strong enough. I'm taking this also from um, frequency measuring data and interpretation of of speeches uh, from the leaders on both sides of the, of the Atlantic that also point in the direction that uh, democracy is mainly their, at least rhetorically, the goal that they have in mind to uh, subscribe every other partner, every other course of action. Now, what transatlantic partners could promote, so those common standards and, reg and regulations, what they could promote under the umbrella of democracy is limitless. So that approach is wide enough to allow consensus, but at the same time, it, it leaves room for so much ambiguity and it creates a vast terrain of uncertainty. And as you can imagine, this has absolutely um, a no um, a good positive effects on the relation itself. Because since President Biden's inauguration, both sides agreed on a functionist approach to democracy and, and seeing it as the key to, to solving pressing problems, but that is not how democracy works. Um, it, you cannot, a democratic consensus between the transatlantic partners is likely to inform action, but the main element of democracies are not self-explanatory or self-regulating. 
So it's not clear what they will agree on. Uh, they don't agree on the prioritization of the rule of law as a common standard, even if they would seem to be promoting um, a similar things. We saw it with the withdrawal of American forces in Afghanistan, that human rights is not high on, on, uh, on the US agenda. It's not high actually on um, European agendas either, because the Europeans do not want to deal with the rights of a potential new wave of Afghani migrants at home. Um, and so I'm, it's not clear that human rights are gonna reign high. But building common standards on fighting climate change maybe the most likely area of collaboration at this point. And we can see happen this week, this week actually we have this um, 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 summit in Pittsburgh on um, technology regulation and tech regulation, trying to find common, um, common ground also in, uh, on, on this, in this area. So climate change and tech regulation could be this proper area of collaboration but it's not really clear uh, how they're gonna do it. And this leads me to the final point on the how. So we can go into more details on why climate, the, the US and the EU have different views on what, to, uh, what kind of common standards to achieve when, when, it's come to, when it comes to um, tech regulation or, or climate change. But just to add, answer the question of how, how to put this, these policies into effect, what they seem to be doing right now, and it, it's, it's a good thing to, to start. The two sides are collaborating again and they are rhetorically much closer. Um, and there are some mechanisms that the Biden administration and the EU aim to develop to, to meet these goals. These are mostly at summit level. And we have these proposed summits when it comes to democracy and technology and also climate. This is very important, but they're only important um, if they're going to have an iterative framework. So if they have to be repeated and they also have to be taken seriously by the leaders um, as, and, and they have to reign high on the agenda because it's the only way in which the diplomats and the experts who are involved in trying to put these agendas together are going to take it seriously themselves. So all the experts and the diplomats who work on these things, um, us uh, commenting, teaching um, students, taking the transatlantic relation um, into account and all these common regulations, it creates an atmosphere of, of support, which also constrains action. It's not clear right now, I, I, it would be a bet that we have to make that these kinds of summits are actually going to be kept at this high level of represent representation and that they're going to be repeated as promised, but quite ambiguously um, and nevertheless every year. So these are the three questions that I think we should kick this off as um, Ivan told me it should be an introductory more uh, uh, statement on, on this cooperation. So to wrap it up, the only uniquely transatlantic overarching goal right now seems to be again democratic promotion. The common rules uh, and standards and regulation that are seen rising, at least at a rhetorical level, mostly relates to climate change, tech regulation, and somewhat human rights. They are considered at different degrees. And how to do it? Well, again, it is, seems to be mostly a diplomatic, um, a diplomatic approach. When it comes to defense, this is the longest running threat in the transatlantic cooperation. It bears um, a lot of importance to talk about what's happening within NATO. NATO is no longer under um, the, the stress that it was uh, before, during the Trump presidency. But at the same time, once again, and we see it with the AUKUS debacle as well, it does seem to, uh, to, to be again important or it reconfirms the need for Europeans to consider um, what it's called now with this buzzword, strate buzzword strategic autonomy. Uh, and the way that they're doing that and how they're building that uh, strategic autonomy, it does seem looking at um, um, their policy in the last 20 years or so, 
that they're building up mechanisms what, without taking into account how these mechanisms would work under NATO umbrella. So again, it does not seem to be a point of cooperation. The deterioration of this relationship has really come to the foreground and, um, and it does not seem clear uh, that we have a way forward <clears throat> that could give us a lot of positive, um, a, a lot of positive view on this. <clears throat> Sorry for that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Veronica. That's uh, really important for us to have a sort of foresight, even if I think you haven't used this word, but this is now a, a fashionable expression of, on a long term uh, development, what we might see more realistically sometimes than, than in a way of wishful thinking. Uh, but I'm sure that uh, the other two speakers might have a different approach, and, um, and I think there will be a real debate uh, what we face uh, today, especially regarding the transatlantic relations. Maybe the next speakers will focus more on the European side, but I'm sure that uh, they will also react uh, to your approach uh, on, on, on long term uh, uh, development uh, and what are the chances of uh, uh, an alliance at all, or whether it will be, as you said, case by case uh, simply, or something uh, what we, what we, many of us still hope that will remind us at least to the 90s of that golden age when, uh, when uh, under, in, under Clinton and later partly, even if it was not the same, under Barack Obama, this relationship seemed to work more smoothly than maybe Today, so these are some questions already raised following uh, Veronica's uh, presentation, and I would like uh, simply give the floor to, the, to our second speaker, Roland Freudenstein, who will speak about again the transatlantic relations, but also about values and great power politics uh, in Central Europe. So we will have a, maybe a different focus, but I'm sure Roland will also react what uh, Veronica. Uh, argued uh, in favor. So Roland, please introduce yourself because you are in a transition position and you can explain it better than I would. So please go ahead, the floor is yours. Yep, thank you, Istvan. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me. And indeed, yes, I'm, I'm this week, I'm transiting from uh, policy director of the Wilfried Martin Center in Brussels which is the um, think tank of the European People's Party, to uh, vice president of Globsec, which is Central Europe's biggest, arguably biggest uh, think tank and conference uh, convener. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm doing this with great enthusiasm, and it certainly means that I will stick to uh, the same set of topics that I've already uh, explored in past decades, um, you know, European security, transatlantic relations, but a special focus on Central Europe and on 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 East East West relations within the European Union, if you want. So, um, actually, my remarks are based on um, a piece um, that I wrote uh, already for an earlier uh, uh, online meeting of the Hungarian Europe Society. And that was really focused exclusively on what's going on in Central Europe and great power conflict, big power conflict in Central Europe. So I will start with this. And then at the end, I will put this into a transatlantic framework and also give some response to Veronica's very interesting remarks. Um, so without further ado, um, let me uh, uh, first state, of course, if you talk about uh, a power politics in Central Europe, and you define Central Europe maybe in concentric circles with the Visegrad group as the innermost one, and then other uh, uh, formerly communist countries uh, 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 grouped around that, but the core really being the, the V4, uh, then you can very easily state that uh, there was no uh, great power in Central Europe since the collapse of the Habsburg Empire. However, Central Europe has become the battleground and in World War II, quite literally, um, of other powers and other ideologies. So that as a, and then after this, I would, I would uh, make five points. First of all, 
questioning or, or, or examining the uh, concepts of power and the concepts of what politics we're talking about here, um, uh, then I would like to uh, say a few words about the two external players that are uh, that have in the last decade or so uh, begun to uh, uh, re-emerge as external actors with their sharp power in Central Europe, and that's Russia and China. Then I'll talk a little bit about what I call small power politics in Central Europe itself, and that is where we talk about the illiberalism or the, the uh, authoritarian populism uh, or was it populist authoritarianism? I forget, but <laughs> in any way, you know what I'm talking about. And, um, and then uh, a, a word about pushback against these tendencies. And finally, uh, why uh, a strong transatlantic relationship would be a good idea in this context. And I'm not making any predictions at this point. That will come later. So uh, what power, what politics? Um, you know, when you hear uh, narratives about 1989 today, and, and there were really, I mean, a generation away from that moment already, um, you get a lot of uh, different interpretations of what it meant or how important it was even. I mean, there, there are people like from, from, from Mr. Fico in Slovakia to, uh, to Orban, Victor, who claim that uh, actually, 1989 was not that meaningful at all. There are much more, uh, much more important dates like 2008 or what have you that, uh, that influence our times. And, uh, and then also there is a debate, what was 89 all about? Uh, and, and, you know, I just uh, I made the effort of looking at three important documents from the Charter 77, uh, uh, to to the uh, the government declaration of Tadeusz Mazowiecki in 1989, to the initial declaration of the Visegrad uh, uh, founding members uh, at the time, still three, uh, in 1991. And and you look at these three texts from three different decades, and what we call today the rule of law and checks and balances and small government and. Um, uh, the rights, of course, human rights, the rights of the individual, civic rights, all this forms a, 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 a core of these three texts, which was expressed in uh, terminology that, of course, is different from what we use today. But, uh, but the, the, the meaning is completely clear what 1989 was all about. It was not about a national liberation. Um, it was not about ethnic factors or or, or, or demographics or uh, anti-migration or what have you, it was about freedom. And it was about freedom guaranteed through checks and balances. So uh, I think that is important to, to, to keep in mind. My second point refers to these external powers that, that uh, uh, managed to gain ground recently in the region. Um, and of course, since 2005, Russia has openly, Russia under Putin, has openly used uh, a, a, a strategic corruption, disinformation, support for radical political parties, elite capture, all together nicely summed up under the label um, sharp power, I would say, uh, as opposed to soft and hard power. Um, and. Uh, um, and, and the reason why, of course, was very clearly that Central European democracies, such as those in other places, from Western Europe to even uh, the countries that constituted uh, uh, once the Soviet Union, democracy, functioning democracies in these countries are an existential threat to the Kremlin, right? The, the Russia is fighting democracy because it might actually uh, reach Russia itself, and the Russians might think that uh, they could also live in a democratic society, which is the biggest existential threat to Putin. Now, um, the, the, the interesting thing, of course, to look at here, in, if we look at the Visegrad group and the external powers like Russia, is, of course, how, how they have managed, for example, through, uh, through energy policy, through uh, uh, financial connections, through uh, smart intelligence work, uh, through a, a joint interest in weakening countries like Ukraine, how they have managed to uh, co-opt uh, the Hungarian government under Fidesz into their uh, strategy uh, so, that, so that there is a certain 
amount of collusion between the current Hungarian government and Russia, despite, of course, the claims of uh, uh, basic transatlantic uh, loyalty uh, made by the Hungarian prime minister, he, he who should not be named. OK, um, but I did it before, so sorry. <laughs> Um, now, China, it, it, uh, without going into much detail, I mean, we all know that after three decades of basically opening the economy of the country and to an extent even politically allowing for some pluralism, after 1982, China in 2012 13, in the wake of the financial, uh, global financial crisis, reverted to a strengthening of one party rule under Xi Jinping. Uh, and it quickly discovered that, that Central Europe can be a particularly uh, 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 rewarding uh, 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 battleground for their own uh, power schemes, uh, and less in terms of uh, lucrative financial deals, but much more in terms of political influence, geopolitics, if you want, uh, through the things like the Belt and Road Initiative, the, 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 the 16 plus one group, 16 again, because Lithuania uh, has just stepped out. Um, and, and here again, Hungary is a case in point where, where it seems sometimes, um, at least if you look at the rhetoric of Fidesz propaganda media, that, that the, 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 uh, the friendship and the admiration for the achievements of the Chinese Communist Party goes far beyond pragmatic financial or economic or business cooperation, but there is a true, a true ideological component to this, to this admiration. Um, so uh, to, to close this point, I mean, the, 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 there, was a, there was a kind of give and take between the determination of these, primarily these two external actors, Russia and China, to uh, utilize Central Europe uh, for their po geopolitical purposes, but at the same time also a certain receptiveness of uh, authoritarian forces within uh, Central Europe to uh, use the, the, the influence of those two big external actors for their own purposes. Third, uh, small power politics. Um, this uh, refers to two things. One, of course, is, is the, 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 the illiberalism itself, which we see manifested today primarily in, in Warsaw and Budapest, but, uh, uh, but in the rhetorics of other political forces, even even in, in countries like Slovakia or Slovenia, for that matter, to go slightly outside the, the Visegrad group. Um, but it, as, as important as the, 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 the authoritarian concept of politics itself is the idea of the Visegrad group as a kind of ideologically charged counterweight to Western Europe most notably to Germany and France. So, so kind of, you know, Viktor Orban has, has oh, I did it again, uh, has uh, uh, said it quite clearly that it, it, the, 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 the mission of the Visegrad group under his leadership, of course, is to become a counterweight against Germany and France and become one of the three big players in European integration. Um, and uh, there, I would say, the, uh, so far, these rhetorical claims have not fully materialized. If you consider that uh, that the 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 real uh, a real community of interest of clearly stated uh, goals of politics uh, it, it refers to very little outside uh, an opposition to uh, to migration uh, and some degree of culture war. Uh, in the European Union. So otherwise, there is very little of a common agenda the way that the way that uh, the Hungarian and Polish government would like it. Now, what what should be done about this, of course, first of all, and, and done by by the EU institutions, the Democrats across the European Union, uh, first of all, to recognize the seriousness of the threat to European integration posed by such uh, authoritarianism and also by the idea to construct Visegrad as an ideological alternative. Um, there, is, uh, there has to be uh, uh, a, a clear pushback against Russian and Chinese influence strategies, which are, of course, not limited to Central Europe, but also go into, uh, into all countries of the European Union with disinfo, with support for radical parties and so on. So here it, we, we need to mobilize on three levels. That's the EU institutions, national governments, and of course, civil society in each of the member states of the European Union. Um, <clears throat> 
and and third uh, the third uh, element of this pushback would be to to better enforce fun fundamental values and 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 that does not mean uh, kicking countries out uh, 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 or 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 telling uh, uh, telling countries they have no place in the European Union, but indeed just to raise the price for the violation of uh, the rule of law and and of the values on which European integration is built. Um, so uh, uh, and incidentally, without raising this price, without showing that there is a price to be paid. Uh, there will also be no credible export of stability, i.e. of good governance, um, uh, to the neighborhood of the European Union. So there is a, there is a direct, if you want, uh, a transactional element in, in enforcing, reinforcing and enforcing um, the rule of law inside the European Union. So to limit small power politics is, is, is uh, elementary here. And fifth, now let me come to transatlantic relations. All this presupposes a strong and vibrant transatlantic relationship. And yes, we have seen dire times. Yes, there have been uh, disappointments with the new administration. There, I, I still see a very strong contradiction between the rhetoric about, for example, uh, a global uh, support of democracy and Democrats. Uh, um, this on the one hand, and the 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 actions of the administration on the other, but uh, this uh, this story has not ended yet. Uh, the, the, like any administration, this one is full of different factions and lobbies, and uh, um, uh, 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 the the Afghanistan withdrawal in itself, I uh, would say, uh, has been a long-standing uh, demand. I do not think that Joe Biden himself saw how clearly the rest of the world would, would make a connection between uh, the way the withdrawal was done and a lacking commitment of human rights. That was a logical observation by others. That was not what was intended by the, by the US administration. And um, uh, uh, let me, I mean, I, I don't have to go into detail about stating the obvious that that of course, if, if the European Union wants to enforce and reinforce values in itself, it needs to be strong. If the European wants, Union wants to be strong, it needs a strong transatlantic relationship, simply because uh, I, I hope we can all agree that uh, strategic autonomy, uh, yes or no, but Europe will not be able to defend itself and to deter threats by actors such as Russia under Putin, uh, in the next couple of decades uh, on all levels from hybrid to conventional to tactical nuclear to strategic nuclear. I think I think we can all agree that this is excluded. So either either we talk of Europe which can defend itself together with the United States or a Europe that cannot defend itself. And a Europe that cannot defend itself against something like a Russian threat is a Europe that will also not be able to live up to its values and enforce them even internally, let alone in the neighborhood of the European Union. Um, so, so let me conclude with this, um, uh, uh, that the, um, uh, the last word about the commitment of this US administration to uh, global democracy support and to, and to overarching values has not been spoken. Um, I, I think we will see development here. We will soon see a trip by Biden to Europe in which he will try to dispel the uh, uh, the, the beliefs that this administration has become purely transactional, as Veronica called it. And one last remark. It is true that the current administration, and here's an overlap with the previous administration, has a different set of priorities when it comes to who is an actual threat to the West. Um, uh, and a different set of priorities compared to most countries in the European Union. Um, and, and in this respect, there is a transactional element uh, where the US asks if the biggest threat to uh, democracy is a global authoritarianism whose cheerleader is now the Chinese Communist Party, then the question of uh, who the US takes serious as a partner and ally is strongly influenced by the question how much that partner can contribute 
in the number one conflict, uh, and this is a conflict about values. This is not a conflict about some, some uh, uh, resources or territories or what have you, as in previous centuries. This is clearly a, a systemic rivalry. Who can contribute how much to this systemic rivalry, which is ultimately a political rivalry? So, um, and we, we need to we need to get we need to deal with this situation, and we haven't dealt with it uh, in the past couple of months. Um, the declarations of European governments, and I, 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 I particularly quote Angela Merkel and 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 President Macron. Uh, have been more than ambiguous. Uh, it is something that is seen as fence sitting in Washington, and uh, we need to stop it. And then the transatlantic relationship can return to some kind of solid basis uh, in order to strengthen democracy also in the European Union. Thank you very much. Thank you, Roland, and thank you for bringing in some uh, actual current uh, political issues into our debates and it's great to combine some theoretical perspectives and with actual political uh, development uh, and uh, and I think then we get closer to to some answers what's going on actually and how to interpret politics of today regarding transatlantic relations now uh, our next speaker just to to uh, make it fast uh, is Thibault uh, Muzelk, who is the author of his forthcoming book, War in Europe. And he, Thibault, was also invited before to Hungarian Europe Society's events. So he is not new for some of us who were already present at previous uh, such uh, uh, events. And uh, uh, certainly Thibault, who is originally French, I might mention it, uh, uh, might uh, focus more on from from his perspective uh, how the European Union as such reacts uh, to 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 the uh, threats and risk we have already discussed and I don't want to focus simply on the current news but maybe it might be important to mention the conflict between France and the United States regarding the uh, nu nuclear submarines and I know that it should not be overestimated, but please mention it into your elaboration, how we should talk about this and how important this conflict is in reality. When you spoke about Europe's future and whether Europe will be able to defend itself without the United States and what should be done to have a more safer uh, continent where most of us actually live in. So the floor is yours, Thibault. Thank you for coming. Köszönöm szépen, István, uh, and, and, and thanks everybody for uh, for being here. I'm I'm really happy to, uh, to 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 be here at the at the European Society. Although only virtually, I hope we'll have a chance to uh, uh, to do this very soon in person. Um, I, I find myself, uh, of course, I will talk about uh, about the submarines because you know you know being French, I can't, I just can't help. I have to. Uh, I'll try to be not as commiserating and as uh, uh, over dramatizing as my as my compatriots, but I, it, it is part of the it is part of the issue, and I think it it, it is very telling of, of of what's going on. So what I've been asked to to think about, and and uh, uh, Roland and Veronica have already talked a lot about super important, and interesting things. So I, I'm I'm kind of in the in the position where where a lot has been said, and what what I will just do is is basically maybe go back to some basic stuff about Europe's position in the world and take a, a view from higher up but that's going to be more blurish uh, but that maybe will put uh, will put some uh, uh, some more context um, so I was asked to to think a little bit about Europe's place in a changing world and uh, there were there were three things that I found are basically the the markers the uh, uh, definers of uh, that that new world that we are that, that, that we're living in. The first one is that it is definitely a, well, it is certainly a, a less less Western world, although I wouldn't say westlessness as they uh, as was put in in Munich uh, a couple of years ago, but it's definitely less Western um, and in particular less European. I think Europeans who were you know really at the top. Uh, I think it was. Uh, 
1914 that Europe was uh, uh, Europeans were were ruling over uh, 75 percent to 80 percent of the land mass and 100 percent of the seas. And because they were so central geopolitically, they came to think that they were still you know the center of the world. But the center had actually moved in the 20th century towards first towards the Atlantic, then towards the United States. And over the 1970s, 1980s, it practically moved towards the Pacific and it is turning again towards the Indo-Pacific. Uh, just think about where the main companies that have emerged over the past 30 years are. They're all on the, on the West Coast. Whether I talk about Boeing, the GAFAM, of course, whether it's Oregon, um, uh, Washington State or California, of course, all of the big companies are there because that's where that's where business is made. And we find ourselves in a, in a situation that is quite unique uh, for Europe since the uh, 15th, uh, 16th century, which is that Europe has become a periphery uh, in the world. And that's not something that a lot of our people uh, have internalized. I think Americans have internalized it. Uh, and, you know, part you, you wanted me to talk about the submarines, I think part of the the frustration of the French over AUKUS and being left out of it has a lot to do with that. You know, France is a resident power in uh, uh, in the Pacific, at least until December, there is uh, New Caledonia, there's Wallis and Tuna, there is French Polynesia, there are also uh, um, overseas territories in the Indian Ocean. Uh, it, France feel that it's uh, that it should be that it should be a player uh, because of this uh, of, of being a resident power, having uh, 1.6 uh, million uh, inhabitants in the uh, in, in the Pacific, but the thing is that that Europe and Europeans are, are mattering much less today, and uh, uh, this is a factor that uh, that we need to take into account. Now, we do not need and we do not want to overstate our case. I think the when we talk about the the, the rise of the rest, as it was called uh, some 10, 15, 20 years ago, uh, this needs to be uh, this can this, this should not be overstated. If you look at the the, the BRICS, the famous you know star players of the of the late 2000s, uh, you know Brazil today, Russia, South Africa, you know all these all are countries with a lot of problems, and they did not uh, they did not live up to. Uh, uh, the promises of development that they uh, that they held 15 years ago. Um, of course, China uh, China has, although we'll see now uh, as they apparently they are on the verge of a uh, of a real estate of a major real estate crisis. How they deal with it, uh, and India may have you know India for the moment is is definitely developing and developing fast, but certainly not as fast. As, as, as some would have liked. So we, we should not overstate our case about the rise of the rest. And the United States is still uh, number one. And I would say number one by further than a lot of people uh, imagine, whether it's in military or economic terms, uh, but definitely less a less Western, uh, uh, a less Western world and a less European world. And you can see that in the, you know, uh, with the number of companies that are in the top, uh, in, in the top world companies right now. Um, it's not like we have to share, it's Americans have to share with the uh, uh, American companies and corporations have to share with Indian and uh, and Chinese companies, major companies, but less and less so with uh, uh, with Europeans. So that's something, you know, this sort of, uh, uh, maybe not irrelevant, but irrelevance, but less relevance of Europe on the on the world map is something that is that is important, and by the way, it, it can be a good thing. It is a good. It can be a good thing to be peripheral if you need to sort out your affairs because there is less uh, interference. But at the same time, and that's also, you know, the, the, the topic of my book. If you are a periphery, as Southeast Asia was during the Cold War, then it is much easier for uh, foreign malign actors to come in and uh, uh, and impose uh, different ways of uh, of sorting out conflict in uh, uh, in the region. So that's something we need to uh, uh, to, to to be worried. About. And that takes me to the um, to the second point, which is that you know this new world is definitely, and for the next for the next few years, for the next decades, uh, <clears throat> going to be defined by the U.S.-China rivalry. I think there's just no no way <clears throat> around it. I know that uh, Europeans would love to uh, uh, to talk about and to hear about a, an economic pa partner and a, and, and a systemic rival or I don't know exactly what I don't remember exactly what the uh, the, the the phraseology uh, has been found in the Brussels bubble but the reality is that 
not only you know is this us china rivalry there and there's just no way around that but you know very often the chinese have actually chosen in which camp we are they talk about us with the west and the thing that they remind uh, whenever there is a crisis the the thing that they remind remind french british german diplomats is not that oh you're not necessarily on the side blah blah blah, blah. they say no you sacked the you sacked the uh, the summer palace back in the 19th century you are also culprits and you should ask forgiveness uh, to the authorities in beijing so um, you know, on, on that side, there is really, it, it is a dangerous game that Europeans are playing, trying to think they can either avoid that, con that, that confrontation. That doesn't mean that they're going to war tomorrow with China, but thinking that you can avoid that confrontation, that you can be neutral, while the others have basically decided that you're not going to be neutral, is an extremely dangerous game. And I think if you want to, uh, uh, um, if you want to, to, to see how dangerous that game is, ask the Belgians of 1940 or 1914, and whether it's a, it's a smart game to be, a, uh, to, 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 to be neutral when uh, the two others, I'm not accusing anyone, but the two other uh, uh, powers want, uh, don't want you to be uh, uh, to be neutral. Uh, now, that being said, that doesn't mean that there is a perfect bipolarity. Just during the Cold War, when there were a lot of um, issues, uh, let's say, uh, local issues and, and local problematics that inserted themselves within a larger rivalry, uh, there is a lot of complexity in this world. Um, the, 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 the bipolarity between China and the US is certainly imperfect. And you can see, for example, that uh, India, which is not going to entangle itself in a, uh, in, 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 probably not going to entangle itself in a, in a formal alliance with the United States for historical reasons, uh, is nevertheless, uh, you know, in the Quad, for example, uh, it's, it, it is allying itself de facto with the United States uh, against, uh, against China, let's put it that way, although, although the Indian authorities would, would probably not phrase it like that. Uh, you have an ally in, um, in NATO, which is Turkey, that is playing a very uh, ambivalent game uh, between the West and Russia and other actors. Uh, it played a very amb ambivalent game in, with ISIS uh, during the early 2010s. Um, and uh, you have, uh, you know, a whole load of actors, Saudi Arabia is another one that acts, you know, sort of independently, but while uh, sort of aligning them, either aligning themselves and uh, either non aligning themselves, but then playing a certain game that brings them towards a, a family. Uh, either you know China or the United States, or uh, trying to uh, trying to survive uh, on its own in a, 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 in an environment and in a bipolar environment. And I think the, the 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 Turkish example is very telling because the Turks have first said where they belong, which is you know they say they are part of NATO. And I think right now uh, uh, President Erdogan is making very clear that they belong to NATO and that they don't want to get out of NATO, uh, while at the same time playing their own partition. And I think the problem with uh, the European uh, Union uh, is that we are doing exactly the other way around at the moment. Uh, we're trying to say uh, we are in, uh, uh, we want to be in between, we want to have things, I, I want to do things my way. Uh, but at the same time, there is no escaping for that, that, that bipolarity. And I think it's if you if you accept the bipolarity and then play with the uh, with the the, the, the the cars that you have in your hands, that's how you achieve some autonomic strategy also by building your own uh, uh, building your own defense and building your own resources. There is nothing more uh, uh, annoying for Americans to be told about, uh, autonomy strategy without a strategy without actually a strategy to make it happen on the ground. So um, that brings me to the to the challenges of uh, for, for for Europe, and I'll, uh, I'll I'll conclude there. Uh, the first challenge is to thrive in a world in which it is definitely less relevant. Uh, to keep unity and cohesion while it is faced with multiple challenges. I think one of the problems with Europe is that uh, the challenges are pretty much everywhere. Uh, there is definitely a threat from the East, direct threat from the East with Russia. Uh, there is a, we have a problem in the Southeast with, uh, 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 with Turkey, and that's not necessarily, uh, I didn't say a threat, but I said a problem. Uh, that's not necessarily something that is understood in the same way everywhere in Europe. And we have a problem in the South with the, uh, uh, the question of migration from Africa, which is 
a long-term problem. And you call it mass migration, whether you want it or, or not, but this is a challenge that we're gonna have to, uh, uh, to sort out uh, together. And finally, uh, in the West, there is the question of managing uh, the transatlantic relationship. And uh, uh, I agree with the previous speakers that there is, uh, um, uh, this is a problematic time. Uh, I wouldn't say we hit a low because the 1930s were definitely much lower in the transatlantic relationship than, uh, 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 than right now. Uh, it's also depending where we put the cursor, right? If we, if we, look, at, uh, if we look at things and say, oh, the uh, transatlantic relationship is much worse than 20 years ago when Jean-Marie Colombadi made this uh, wonderful op-ed, we are all Americans. Uh, yes, certainly, uh, for Le Monde. Um, compared to 15 years ago, where everybody in Western Europe hated the United States for going to war in, in, in Iraq, well, you know, this can be more debatable. So, you know, we have to, we have to understand that the uh, the, the, the relationship between, uh, uh, between the United States and Europe is one that is changing in which there are highs and lows. Uh, I think today there are reasons to be pessimistic. I think, you know, uh, Veronica mentioned Donald Trump, uh, but we need to mention Brexit as well. I mean, I think Brexit is also a problem because it really uh, puts a, uh, a divide, a clear divide between Anglos and Euros. And it's also a cultural divide. And as a Frenchman, uh, you know, over to AUKUS, uh, I think, you know, this is something that we need to raise uh, to our, towards our, our American partners. And in AUKUS, I heard, you know, on Twitter, some, some of my friends saying, ah, oh, AUKUS, well, but it's great, it's fantastic. You French people are just, uh, uh, you wanted your strategic autonomy, but now you have it. And by the way, AUKUS is fantastic. And we're going to, and I, I agree with that. I, I take it, you know, I, I am the first person to criticize my fellow countrymen for not aligning themselves with America before taking, uh, 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 taking autonomous, uh, an autonomous stand. But what the French are asking right now, and that's something that following Brexit is very important, is, is the transatlantic relationship a two-tired relationship? Is there the Anglos on the one hand and the Euros on the other hand? And are the Euros playing in the second division to take a football uh, or soccer or however you want to, you want to call it uh, uh, imagery? And I think this needs to be this needs to be taken seriously because, uh, and here is a transatlanticist who doesn't believe in that, uh, that, that there is a two-tire or that there should be a two-tire relationship. Uh, but, you know, and, and that's also something that is important because uh, for the Pacific, because in AUKUS, the K doesn't stand for Korea, right? So uh, I think, uh, it, you know, uh, India, India will not want to entangle itself formally into an alliance with the United States of America, but it will not want to be treated as a second rate power. And um, I hope very much that Europe will integrate further and will become a, uh, a, a force of its own. And I do not think that, you know, either you know, Germany on its own or France on its own or the European Union as a whole will want to be treated in a worse way than the United Kingdom. Uh, in the Pacific or in when it comes to Central and Eastern Europe. So um, the, the, the Europeans definitely have a lot of work to do in terms of what they define as strategic autonomy and maybe who is the enemy, right? And uh, as Roland rightly pointed out, uh, that understanding that this is a uh, uh, th this is a contest about values. This is not only about selling cars to uh, one side of the Atlantic or the other side of the Eurasian landmass. Uh, and on the other hand, there is also questions that need to be asked about the nature of the relationship and, and whether, whether it's, it, it's a two, three, four type system. And I think this is something that needs to be, these questions need to be asked um, during these conferences, but also between closed, closed doors between diplomats. And I, uh, I'm afraid I don't have the, the answer to that because that's, that's something that, you know, uh, Joe Biden, uh, uh, Emmanuel Macron, the successor to Angela Merkel and uh, uh, Ursula von der Leyen will need to, to talk about, but, but that's definitely a conversation that needs to, be, uh, to happen. And on this, I will leave you the floor. Thank you. Well, thank you, Thibault. It, uh, what, what you spoke about shows us how complicated these issues are, actually, that uh, all of you talked uh, from a different perspectives, and actually the picture has been broadened, and maybe 
there are no clear-cut answers to, to all these issues because these are so intertwined and so complicated. I, I just add two things quickly. One is that the internal differences inside the European Union amongst the member states, you haven't mentioned you know, different approaches from the former German government or the French approach, which is a traditional differentiation regarding the transatlantic relations. And maybe another point what we might still discuss, this is uh, Russia from a very simple perspective. Uh, people have a fear, I think, that maybe one day Russia might cooperate with China against the democratic world. I know that this is very simplistic and that there is no such a clear present danger at all at the moment. But when we talk about the future, we actually don't really know. So I would be interested in your views, but my suggestion would be at this point, if you have any short reactions to e on each other's uh, uh, presentations, we might have a very fast uh, uh, circle for you, or otherwise I would propose to collect at the already at the moment, uh, questions and comments from the audience. We have almost uh, uh, 25, 30 minutes uh, left for this uh, session. So if you have any short comments, please go ahead, uh, Veronica, Roland, or Thibault uh, to each other. If not, uh, yeah, Veronica, please go ahead. Yes, there was the, the hand raised. I just want to make one point about what is happening internally in the US, because that also matters a lot. Um, and the Biden administration is mostly concerned with domestic politics and then the political and then the societal rifts um, in American society. And that will also have an, a major influence uh, because there is a significant lack of consensus at home that continues to diminish the relative um, uh, influence of the US abroad. So that is also a point that um, um, we should talk about and that was mentioned before. Um, and the second point about the deal with uh, uh, within AUKUS uh, or the new AUKUS deal, um, we have to keep in mind as well, and this connects back to what, um, what was mentioned previously, we have to keep in mind that the it was the Australians that pursued uh, to enhance their um, uh, strategic defensive capabilities um, in, in the Pacific um, and that the nuclear uh, submarines are superior to diesel power submarines. The problem was uh, that the French had, or had proposed to sell these kind of submarines to, to the Australians and they did not agree uh, to this. The point to make and uh, to complete um, uh, Thibault's um, 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 very on point comment um, is that when you get into a situation of trouble, you would much rather have the US on your side, right? So you really want to invest um, uh, in that relationship. The problem is that the US prioritized having a fast success on these on this deal and did not inform their European partners. And this is a matter that speaks back to the lack of trust, because if they had informed that all this conversation about what is uh, the importance of NATO for the US and what is the transatlantic relation would have sound would have pressured the US um, in, in different ways and they did not want that. So they did prioritize fast success at the expense of being transparent with their allies. And this shows that this, there are structural problems um, uh, in, the, in this relation um, that just are, are not easy to, um, to, to get over um, uh, just through rhetorical um, action. Thank you. Thank you, Veronica. Just, uh... Just a short comment that I'm not an expert on that issue, but sometimes I have a feeling that a sort of amateur mistake was made by the Biden administration and maybe it was not intended to 
humiliate the, the French government and to create a, a conflict which is on the first page of the international media at the moment. But maybe I am too naive and you're right that there are some basic uh, facts be, behind this behavior and lack of communication, as you, as you said. Uh, who else would like to, I think that, uh, 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 Roland, you raise your hand, that's, that's clear. Okay, go ahead, please. Yeah, yeah, thanks. I, I just want to come back to your question, Istvan, about Russia and China, because it, indeed it's, it is complicated, as the saying goes on Facebook. Um, you know, that relationship is short of an alliance, but it certainly is more than just a tactical uh, marriage of convenience, if you want, or, 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 or fling of convenience. Um, it is something in between. And, and one thing is really important to see, and this brings me back to what I talked about foreign actors in Central Europe and malign uh, foreign influence in Central Europe. China has taken a page from the Russia, from the Russian textbook in using uh, disinformation, uh, using strong arming, um, uh, arm twisting of countries, uh, uh, elite capture, um, I mean, in all these elements, uh, China has really taken Russia and Putin as an example. Now, to what extent are these two countries now um, friends forever and best friends forever? Uh, of course, the jury is out. And of course, there is still an enormous amount of distrust between them, but they have a common enemy at the moment. And that is, it's, it's not just the US as a country, it's not the European Union as an actor. It is democracy. It is freedom. It is uh, uh, checks and balances. Um, and that carries a long way in terms of uh, making Russia and China at the moment cooperate on a very strategic level, uh, exchanging military technology, exchanging so-called regime, uh, regime security technology, you know, like facial recognition and 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 uh, how best how best to 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 crack down on uh, an opposition that uses 21st century instruments now on all these things russia and china are very much on the same line what does it mean for us and, and this is why i'm spending so much time here because there is a narrative in the west and again you know hard not to mention paris and the french president there is a narrative that if we're just a little bit nicer to Putin, we can pry him away from, from China because the Russians and Chinese don't like in each other anyway. Uh, it's a false narrative. First of all, it underestimates the nevertheless ideological component in the Russian-Chinese relationship. And second, uh, what precisely does uh, being a little bit nicer to Putin mean? It means, compromising on fundamental principles such as uh, you know the, the the world order as we understand it and the order of Europe as we understand it and that countries can choose their their political systems and alliances freely it would mean to give Russia a sphere of influence um, and and that I'm afraid is a price way too high uh, to pay so so I'm sorry for for taking so much time on this, but I think it's really important in the current debate. Russia and China, for the moment, will have to be seen as very much uh, aligned on the issue of their enmity to global democracy support. Yeah, thank you, Roland. That's, that's very, very important. Uh, Thibault, would you like to have a comment, especially um, on the issue of the German-French tandem inside the European Union and how it might be changed uh, following the German election. Certainly we don't know what sort of coalition government we will have in weeks or maybe months, but still uh, the, the different approaches have a history regarding the two countries. And what Roland spoke about, uh, especially regarding Russia, there is a there has been a difference between the two countries for a long period. Maybe it has changed recently. Uh, it was actually a couple of years ago, Germany, which had a more sort of 
moderate stance towards Russia, arguing in favor of dialogue that has changed a couple of years ago. So what you will foresee, how it will be seen uh, in a couple of years regarding the reaction of the European Union as a whole, having these two crucial member states uh, in, in its uh, links and files. Um, th th thank you, Ispan. Uh, so, first of all, we, we, we don't know the name of the, of, of the future chancellor, but we don't know the name of the future president, right? We are, we're not certain that it will be Emmanuel Macron. And if it's uh, some uh, uh, Xavier Bertrand, then there might be some continuity uh, in, the, uh, uh, in, 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 in the way France approaches things. If we have a Marine Le Pen or an Eric Zemmour as, a, uh, as president, then that, that might change a lot of things not only for France, but probably for, for Europe. I actually don't see that much difference between Germany and France, to be honest, uh, on, the, on the Russia issue. Um, as far as I can remember, Nord Stream is a, is a German, Russian, German endeavor in which French capitals are involved. Uh, I think uh, the sort of Ostpolitik that we've seen uh, coming up or the, the temptation of Ostpolitik that were checked by Angela Merkel uh, in the, uh, but I would say less and less in the, in the previous years is something that, you know, that they can do. So the, the, the language may be, may be different, but the, uh, the temptation to appease Russia uh, is definitely there for you know geographic slash historical reason. I think the French are feeling much less threatened by Russia because they're on the other side of the of the continent. Although they tend to forget that the the Russians came to Paris at some point. Um, the uh, as far as the, as the Germans are going, this is more about uh, and, and the French are more promoting uh appeasement with russia or or, or or trying to find a way to uh to, to to work with russia in with both in terms of uh grandeur you know this idea of grandeur working in the security council you know solving the problems of the world also because the the russians are hunting in their uh in their playground in uh, in Africa, and they want this to stop. So, you know, one way to do it is to uh, to have friendlier uh, friendlier relationships. Uh, you know, you may or may not know that there are Russian troops, or well, not Russian troops, sorry, Russian para paramilitary private army slash whatever you want to call it, Wagner, which apparently does not even exist officially in Russia. So, whatever, but they're here in Mali, and that's causing uh, that's causing a major brawl between Paris and uh, uh, and Bamako, which which by the way is also showing you. Uh, how much of a mistake it is for to dissociate uh, what is going on towards our east and what is going on towards our south? Because in this global world, you know everything is uh, interconnected. Everything was interconnected before, but every, ever more so, uh, ever ever more so now. So I don't think there is that much. I mean, you know, beyond beyond the the the, the, the phraseologies and all that, I think you know this tendency to appease Russia. Uh, from either France or Germany is something that 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 you know I wouldn't say that is natural, but that it, it does uh, exist. I'm afraid that the oak, as far as, as Paris is concerned, the the spat over over AUKUS and the way uh, the way sometimes has been overlooked by by a number of people on our uh, on our side in the, the among the transatlantic transatlantists has strengthened the hand the hand of those people that I call continentalists. Uh, in France, but also elsewhere, that you know, that try to to uh, uh, to promote better relationships towards the continent rather than uh, towards the Atlantic. So more about interests rather than uh, uh, rather than that, 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 than values. And I, you know, this is something that I I fight against every day. So uh, we need. Uh, I think we need to make the case a bit more forcefully. Um, there, uh, about that, there is a word that we basically haven't heard during this whole discussion, and it is the West. Uh, and I think we have come to be very, very shy about using this word, uh, either because on the far left, people are telling you that it's racist, or on the far right, people are telling you that it is in terminal decline, and because there's not enough, there's not enough Christianity in it, or uh, whatever. But I think, I think it's, it, it, it is, it would be a mistake to ditch the West. Um, and I think France and Germany needs to, need to, uh, uh, to, to think about that, because uh, uh, the Cold War was one by the West, I, I am 
pretty sure that if there is a if there is a second cold war it will be won by the west and i think both france and germany need to uh, uh need to think about it and again need to think which side they're on before uh before they are before they make decisions about autonomy autonomy and and implement it uh but but that's what i i would say about that great just before i give the floor to roland i would like to ask the the people in the audience for whether they will make a presentation later on or or not if you want to have a, a comment or a question please send uh, us uh, your question in the chat box or raise your hand as veronica did uh, uh, using one of these uh, clicking uh, uh, figures uh, or or just uh, start to speak well we might uh, uh, mute you but uh, let let let's send a, send send me a signal roland the floor is yours Yes, just very briefly on this question of the West that Thibault rightfully uh, mentioned. You know, there is an interesting interview with Christoph Heusken, the outgoing uh, Angela Merkel's right hand on, on foreign policy uh, and security. And, and he makes a very uh, clear statement in the interview that he has stopped using the term the West because it only gives Russia and China the opportunity to create uh, uh, the image of a, of a common enemy and a common enemy that belongs to the 20th century, you know? So in other words, if you use the term the West, you're already playing into the hands of our enemies. Well, I'm afraid that's, yeah, if anything, that's probably a self-fulfilling prophecy, um, you know, because the, the, he does make a right point that the values which we connect with the West are universal values. And if we even seem to declare that this is like, uh, uh, yeah, these are European values or transatlantic values that we want to impose on other parts of the world, then exactly we're on the wrong foot already. I totally buy this narrative, but I would not let go of the term the West. We're talking about universal values such as human rights, but also liberal democracy which are universally valid and due to certain historical constellations and circumstances have emerged in Europe and in the West uh, in past centuries. So to make this fine uh, terminological distinction has huge political significance. And, you know, I mean, voices like Christoph Heusken should be heard in this, um, but then also should be duly, duly responded to. Thanks. Yeah, I think that rhetoric or symbols matter a lot. And just referring to the Hungarian primaries at the moment, uh, the, the opposition, especially the liberal momentum, uses the, the word best, which is our future again. So uh, in these countries, I think when we all wanted to join the West 20, 30 years ago, the West has for many of us still uh, a positive message. It's just a comment, and certainly for those who support uh, anti-Westerners uh, in Hungary, uh, West became an ugly word. So it's really a cleavage which might be known by by the by politicians on on the Western part of the European Union. Now we have a question uh, which brings us, uh, as I try to bring you to to our. Uh, region to Central Europe uh, by Robert Soltik uh, from, from uh, a Polish perspective. Uh, you might also read it that he argues that the new German, German Chancellor, especially if this is Mr. Scholz, may face even more hostile rhetoric from the Polish government, in partic particular if rule of law issues will be more in focus. Uh, or he also mentions the relations with Russia and Turkey and the very uh, bad situation on the Belarusian uh, border, the eastern border of uh, Poland. So it reminds us that we have many other issues which uh, the European Union should uh, face uh, beside the great power politics. But inside the EU, uh, these, these relations between Poland and Germany or Hungary and Germany or the relations to 
to, to Belarus or, or Russia might differ from country to country. And it brings back to, to a region where illiberalism is so strong. And these countries, Poland and especially Hungary, have their special political line regarding, uh, regarding Russia and China, what Roland talked about before. So what would be your reaction regarding Poland and maybe Hungary and the, and the, and the region as such in case uh, uh, the new, new German chancellor might try to fix this problem in a way, uh, ju just uh, in contrast to Angela Merkel, who might be admired because of many reasons. But there is a lot of criticism that she did not face this problem, the rule of law problem, or generally the deterioration of democracy inside, within the European Union. Uh, and there is another question, and I would suggest uh, uh, for, for our speakers that we collect more questions. So I see Zsuzsa Salini raising her hand. So Zsuzsa, the floor is yours. Please unmute yourself or, okay, very good. Yes, hello. Hello. Can you hear me well? Yes. Hi, hello everyone. Well, thank you very much for all these uh, very interesting uh, contributions. Um, uh, you are in the very the heart of this all this very complicated world uh, we uh, we live in. And um, Mark Leonard just published a book, uh, The World of Unpeace, where among many other things, he says that that we have to think uh, in a different way on war than than the classical war because there are so many various ways how countries can interfere in other countries life, uh, especially uh, regarding the technological development and intelligence and everything. So that, that war today is different than it was 50 or 100 years ago. And um, so my, my question would go, how far in this new complicated things when smaller countries can actually use uh, technology uh, to disturb the world, they, it is much cheaper to influence international relations than before. You don't necessarily have to have a big and strong army in order to, to interfere into um, bilateral or European or even global relationships. So there are much more players in the global world uh, than, than just the big powers. And my question is, uh, is, is to all of you, is how far did the do, do you agree that smaller smaller countries small powers as as Roland said have actually much more influence on shaping the global world and how this would influence that well whether they can also participate in setting the new rules or it's still a big power story thank you uh, thank you, thank you, Zsuzsa. And I would like to add uh, one element to, to your question to our speakers. Maybe we haven't mentioned terrorism as such when talking about international order and it, Zsuzsa mentioned uh, special players, uh, uh, but mostly maybe states, but there are other uh, actors who are not states, but terrorist groups. And I think 15 years ago, we would have all talked about terrorism. And just a couple of years ago, because of ISIS, maybe also. And now nobody mentioned this problem until now. So please uh, include uh, uh, terrorism into your final comments uh, when we are heading towards sort of conclusion. But we still have some more time for questions or comments if anybody would like to raise his or her hand. Okay, Veronica and Thibault would like to comment right now. Please, Veronica, go ahead. So I'm going to uh, pick up on um, uh, Susanna's question because um, I, I think it's incredibly important. Um, the answer, or my answer from the, this perspective of both the transatlantic relationship and the, what's happening in Central and Eastern Europe, because that's what I imagine Susanna is also thinking about when she says, small power influence um, is that there are degrees of influence, right? So you can influence things in different ways given the complexity of the system. 
And this is a very complex system and it's very dynamic. So the fact that these countries create coalitions, it's, um, it's very important because they do shape uh, this, um, um, the culture of the rule of law, for example, in Europe, and by shaping the culture of the rule of law, just by adding, you know, illiberalism in front of democracy and making that a thing at some point, um, you are already shaping the conversation. And then when, you're, when the big players uh, can't wait to use the same kind of conversation, um, and to, to use the same kind of, of memes, um, and that is also quite, quite important. So the US will influence things differently if they push for illiberalism, uh, but that doesn't mean that Poland or Hungary don't um, have their own influence on this. And, and it's, it's quite large, uh, also through the multi-level setting of the European Union. Now, the other question about the technology um, and the re-understanding of war, there is absolutely no appetite. And also when I worked for the, uh, for the Romanian government and the, the presidency and, and NATO, there is no appetite to redefine war because the moment that you redefine war as also hybrid war, then NATO would be at war with, um, with Russia just by the fact that they've attacked the Estonian um, um, electrical grid uh, years ago. So nobody wants to do that for the time being, but everybody thinks about it. And at this point, this is something that is mostly dealt with um, by referring to how can big tech help us? What is, um, uh, what, how can we get those giants involved um, in, in also how to better protect our cyberspace? Um, but it's not something that um, I haven't read um, a Marxist book yet. Um, but um, I, I'm, so I don't know how he deals with this, uh, but it's definitely not an appetite at all to redefine war in those terms, because that would just bring a whole host of problems uh, for the time being. Yeah, thank you. Well, it's certainly if I understand it correctly, a debate on definitions and how to call it, but the problem exists. So it's anyway, somehow we should face it. In the sense that they won't define it until they have a solution. When <laughs> the solution is reached, then the definition will follow, <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah, that's that's not the very scientific way, but that sounds very realistic. Thibaut, the floor is yours. Thank you. I, I, I think uh, that there's just no scientific way to do this because it, it needs to be negotiated. And, uh, uh, you know, right now there is been, there are negotiations that have started about, you know, cyber warfare or cyber security, however you want to, uh, however you want to call it, but it, it, it is a reality. And I think we've seen it uh, uh, all during the 2010s uh, that, you know, uh, the cyber element has been, uh, has been part, uh, cyber element, the informational element, the economic elements have, have, have become much more integrated uh, in warfare, whether we put that in as warfare or not. Uh, warfare itself with weapons has also evolved. And uh, you can, with, uh, there was mention of Turkey, and I'll get back to that, but uh, uh, the, 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 the drone warfare, uh, whether it's the drone warfare in, a, in an asymmetric conflict like the one uh, by the United States against uh, terrorism in Afghanistan, uh, or the drone warfare that was uh, that was waged uh, by Turkey uh, in uh, or oh, by Turkey by Turkey's ally Azerbaijan, but with Turkish drones uh, uh, in uh, in Nagorno Karabakh is a very good example on how warfare is uh, is evolving. And uh, uh, yes, it changes the. It, it, it changes quite a few things. The problem, and that's what also I explain in, uh, uh, in my book, I, I too have not yet read uh, Mark's book, but it's, it's, it's a chapter in my, uh, in my forthcoming book. Um, the, 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 the Europeans are already one generation late. When the, you know, the, 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 the thing is that uh, when uh, other armies, other uh, military headquarters, started rearming in the mid 2000s, uh, the Europeans decided to stay where they were and they're completely, they, find, they found themselves in the uh, early mid 2000s, uh, completely 
uh, uh, clueless about what was going on much more than uh, uh, than other countries. So now we, we find ourselves in a situation where we need to, to rearm ourselves, we need to rearm ourselves uh, fast, create, or if you want to, to put it like that, create, uh, I, I can't remember what's the, 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 the language that is, that, that, that is used now, but create uh, resilience, create new resilience, new certainties uh, in the cyber, in the cyber, cyber domain, but but not only, you know, there's also it's also drones having uh, and, and, and get ready for great power competition. And this gets us to the question of, of, of small powers, uh, whether they have an oversized power. I think I think the time in which uh, it's a double edged sword because they they can have uh, they can give an impression that they have an oversized influence. Uh, and here we're getting to the question of, you know, whether being part of the EPP or part of something else uh, is, is a good idea or not. I think uh, Emmanuel Macron's adventures uh, have shown that it's very difficult, even when you're the second uh, power in Europe, to reshape the whole uh, political debate and the whole political families in Europe on your own. Uh, and I, I, I tend to think that uh, this is a mistake that others are, are, are doing right now. Um, but the, the thing is that right now, in, in, in a time in which the attention is moving away uh, from terrorism and more into great power competition, uh, in a time in which, uh, let's put it, let, let, let's be clear, uh, the state uh, is uh, the, 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 the general and overall tendency and probably the long-term tendency is one of uh, state capacity building of more state intervention, the smaller powers will find it very difficult to, uh, to matter as much as they did in the 2000s and 2010s. Uh, ask the Maltese and the Cypriots uh, right now about you know, how they can keep on uh, you know, uh, giving, let's say, uh, safe haven, including financial, to a number of financial actors, including malign ones. Uh, they're finding it more and more difficult because pressure is put by the big, uh, by the big powers to, uh, uh, to stop these, uh, these activities. And I think um, you know, the, the, the recovery fund uh, is, is economic, of course, right? It, it's meant to be a, a, an economic tool, but it, it, it puts a lot of arguments uh, for the ones who hold the money. And the ones who don't have the money basically, you know, need, it doesn't mean, you know, you need to comply on everything. You can always play, right? The, the, it's the whole, the whole uh, uh, dialectic of the master and the slave. Uh, but, but they're, you know, the ones who, in, in, in the world, the ones who weigh uh, 120 kilos uh, when they talk, the ones who weigh 60 kilos listen. And that's unfortunately, whether you like it or not, that's a, uh, uh, th this is a, a rule of international relation. And here, you know, the, the commission has been handed a, uh, a, a massive argument uh, to push for its agenda. So, um, you know, we get back to Poland. Uh, I agree that, you know, Poland is trying to, uh, uh, to gain some autonomy and to, to, to gain some, uh, I was about to say strategic autonomy, but that would probably not be taken well in some circles, uh, but it's trying to, to play one, you know, to play to to buy uh, weapons in, uh, in in Turkey, trying through the the Three Seas Initiative, also to have a presence in the in the uh, um, uh, in the Black Sea. But at the end of the day, it's very difficult to escape geography. Uh, and uh, uh, Germany is very close, and Germany is a prime partner, is a prime commercial partner. And uh, uh, you know, at some point, you can you can say whatever you want you can do whatever you want you, you if you are if you are interlocked in a relationship like that you need to think about how this relationship what where you want to bring this relationship i don't think you know right now everybody looks at poland as being a uh, and the peace government as being this sort of uniform illiberal uh, uh government uh, and you know that some people may argue that it's like hungary well the, actually it's it's not at all like hungary it's a coalition in which there are many different interests that are playing against each other and um you know uh, uh poland has its own has its own problematics right so uh it, it, Poland will find if, if Poland plays too hard on that chord, it will find it very, very difficult to keep on its it, its policy of equidistance or however they want to call it. Because at, at, at the end of the day, you know, if they if they go with the Chinese, they will they will not be with the Americans and they will not be protected by the uh, uh, by NATO. If they if they go with the Turks too far, you know, it might be that. Some people in Brussels or in Berlin will say, "We'll just, we'll just want to pull the plug," and and this is already, 
a debate that is starting to, to, to come up in Western Europe, not necessarily in Germany, but definitely in the Netherlands, definitely in France. And, you know, again, this raises the question, who are we as Europeans? How do we define us as Europeans? So maybe, you know, the question of the two tired, uh, uh, the two tired European Union is something that Eastern Europeans may want to ask their Western, Western European counterparts. And, and maybe there should be an answer to that, a, a satisfactory answer that the Western Europeans need to come up with on that. I, I, I definitely agree with, but, but at the end of the day, you can't escape geography. You can't escape hard facts, particularly in a world that is much more defined by great power competition. Yeah, th thank you, Thibault. I, uh, it just reminds me certainly on uh, on Hungary, where uh, Viktor Orban would like to get rid of uh, geography and tries to play a very important role, much behind uh, uh, you know the real capabilities uh, of Hungary, not only ideologically, but in a way he plays a strategic gamble, uh, which might create a lot of problems uh, in the eyes of uh, Brussels and Washington. So um, I, I doubt whether this is a, it's certainly not realistic, but in a sense of political gamble, I think it's also a non-efficient method what he is using. But I think we don't have time now to analyze populist foreign policy as such, even within the European Union, why the peace government and or why Viktor Orban, even if they are not exactly the same, are playing these uh, games, whether it's a sort of domestic politics, which they use uh, when foreign policy they use for domestic objectives, or whether it has a special important place in their political and ideological uh, agenda. Maybe we, we might come back to that sooner or later again. Now, Roland, I, Roland, I think the, the time is getting uh, very sharp. So uh, I would like to ask you to, to react and maybe to conclude, and then we will see whether the other two speakers still have anything to say, but we will have to soon finish uh, this session. So Roland, the floor is yours. Yeah, okay, thanks. And sorry that I had some brief absences, but it was a domestic emergency. So anyway, um, I, I, I want to come to this point that Robert Sotik uh, raised with the German-Polish relations and also the whole rule of law question with new German government. Well, we don't have a government yet, but um, indeed, I think, uh, I think uh, Mr. Olaf Scholz is the likeliest uh, future chancellor of Germany. Uh, heading a coalition with the Liberals and the Greens. Now, what does that mean for German-Polish relation? First of all, uh, culture war uh, is going to intensify. Um, I mean, uh, Thibault is right that Poland is not Hungary and, 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 and the governing uh, a coalition of forces in Warsaw is more complex than the one in Budapest. That is true, but uh, let's not forget that Antagonism to Germany is uh, a part of the political identity of, uh, of most of peace and certainly of Jarosław Kaczyński. Um, and and they, will, they will go to, 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 to great lengths uh, to use that instrument because they just believe in it. Whether this objectively damages their other foreign policy uh, objectives uh, is a completely secondary question to them. I mean, the, 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 the chairman, uh, Kaczynski, Prezes, as they call him in Polish, uh, he does not care about uh, any kind of objective definition of Polish national interests or something. Uh, uh, he believes that he has a sacred mission um, to, to bring Poland back to, back to Christian values and, and, and also to defy, to defy the Germans. I mean, that's absolutely clear. So you can expect some, some fireworks on this front in the future. Now, is this going to apply to uh, a, a, a political substance and to geopolitical maneuvering? Uh, I don't think we will see too much of a difference between the next German government and the one of Angela Merkel when it comes to Russia, comes to um, uh, 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 forcefully uh, representing values. Sure enough, the green element in the next government is going to be much more emphasizing values. But at the same time, the Greens are also the ones who are most skeptical about um, 
classical power instruments. Uh, and you know, without hard power, soft, uh, soft power very often uh, ends up being no power. Uh, so, and, and this is something that the Greens still have not understood and they probably won't in the future. Um, besides that, the, 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 the much weakened green position compared to three months ago will probably make them focus on their core issue, which is, which is climate change. And foreign policy will definitely play second fiddle for the Greens. Um, last uh, point here, the rule of law question. Now, there have been prominent Social Democrats and Greens who in the last couple of years in the European Parliament, but also in the German government have um, emphasized the rule of law vis-a-vis -vis the governments in Poland and Hungary much more strongly than Angela Merkel has. Um, is that going to be a policy line which will uh, balance out the, let's say, innate pragmatism of Olaf Scholz? Uh, the jury is out. It is impossible to, to predict at the moment. But there will be forceful voices in the next administration that will demand a more rigorous application of things like the um, uh, the the rule of law uh, the, the uh, rule of law mechanism and the uh, the financial conditionality in in the recovery funds and so on. So so yes, here I would say a, a cautious. A cautious yes to the question, is the new German government going to be tougher on Kaczynski and Orban? Cautious yes. Great, thanks. Uh, thanks, Roland. Uh, we have to close very soon, so I would like to ask uh, Thibault first and then Veronica to make final comments as well, uh, especially maybe about our big topic, that is international order whether what we face now is something very new, a sort of disorder or a balance between big powers or a more complex world you all try to describe. How, what would be your short comment on that? But what will be the 20s of the 21st century look like regarding international relations? So, yeah. so extremely quickly, uh, I think in the, 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 the notion of international order is something that you that you see exposed, uh, you know, after 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 a certain order or a certain balance, as Colas, everybody says, oh, it was better before there was order and now there is disorder. Uh, I remember in the 90s, everybody talked about about disorder, while actually the world was actually quite unipolar. And uh, you know, the there is, I mean, there is an order or, or, or a disorderly order or an ordered disorder, whatever you want to call it. Uh, the, uh, whether you like it or not, uh, international relations has always been a jungle to take uh, a, a, an image that was uh, used by in, uh, in Kagan's last book. Uh, it's always been a jungle. We made it look a bit more like a garden uh, during the times of unipolarity of the United States. It's always been a jungle everywhere. And we just need, and Europeans really need to wake up to that, to that fact, to that factor, uh, build up their capacities. Also, I really want to really focus on that to 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 build up a, a European doctrine, right? Because this is important, so that you know whether in Berlin or in Athens, in Paris or in Warsaw, uh, we have one single doctrine as to what are the threats and uh, uh, who are our partners and how, where we need to go forward. Otherwise, Europe will not go forward and, and, and potentially will potentially explode. So uh, th this is the warning that I'd, like to, uh, that, that I'd like to give. I know it's not, it doesn't sound very positive. I myself am actually positive about the future. I think we can do it, uh, but, uh, but yeah, now it's in our hands to make it work. Uh, thank you, Thibault. Uh, well, Veronica, do you see the future also as a sort of jungle regarding international politics and relations? Well, more of a jungle than what? When has it ever not been a jungle, right? So it's, it's a complex system and as always the challenge is to reduce it to its dimension, to those dimensions that are most relevant in trying to make forecasts. And uh, to stick uh, to stay in the, in the conversation that we've had today, unfortunately, the transatlantic relation is not one of the most important dimensions that can um, uh, have an, an effect on what the world order will look like um, uh, in the 
in our forecasts from, from now on. So unless we look at this in parallel with other relations and other important um, uh, elements of analysis, uh, we are really going to be blindsided uh, for whatever will happen in the future. Okay, thank you. Roland, just one sentence for the future. Uh, wir schaffen das. <laughs> That's great. That's like Timo uh, said, we can do it. Great. Uh, finally, some optimism from some of you. Very nice. Uh, I would like to thank all of you, uh, especially to the three speakers. I think we had a fascinating uh, first uh, session. Uh, and thanks for all who contributed or listened uh, to the debate uh, this morning. Uh, we will face a long, long event today in the afternoon and early evening. So we really need a sort of online lunch break at the moment. I hope many of you will come back and listen to the first, uh, further presentations. We start at uh, 1.30, so please come back a little bit before, let's say 1.20, not to have uh, uh, technical difficulties. And uh, thanks again, uh, Veronica, Roland, Thibault, all of you, and uh, I think it was a fantastic start. Everything has been recorded, so you can look later on what you really said, uh, and was it correct or not, and, what, and I think it was an interesting debate, and many details might be checked again when we will put all this debate, like all the others, on our website. I see that Veronica and Thibault would like to say something, maybe just say goodbye uh, very shortly, because we really oh, need- Oh, no, it was just a goodbye and many thanks. Many thanks, Ishtar. Yeah, many thanks for all of you. See you soon, and please come back. Don't switch off or just come back uh, in right time. See you soon again. Very nice having you with us. Bye-bye, bye-bye. <laughs>